So good evening, everyone, once again. Nice to see you. And this evening, we're going to 16th century Spain. <laughs> and um, really happy to welcome you, Julien, to our new center. You're no stranger to this place, I don't think. <laughs> and Julien is a Jungian analyst. And uh, getting to be quite an expert or, or, on the Spanish mystics, particularly St. Teresa. And she's just brought out a new book, well, a second edition of her book on St. Teresa with a new introduction called Towards Mystical Union, which are for sale there. So welcome. Thank you. And um, over to you. Right. Can you all hear me? It's really lovely to be here again. I think the first Roots course was 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and I was on that. And then I've taught on the Spanish mystics on most of the subsequent ones. So it's really lovely to be here in this new, beautiful golden space. But I'm going to speak about another Spanish mystic tonight, um, to Isuela's teacher, who is very little known, and it is in the introduction to the second edition of my book. So there were many, many Spanish mystics, which I'm going to comment on. So it's you in for a real treat tonight. I want to give a little bit of an introduction, and I don't know if some of the other speakers have spoken about the importance of a course like this, but also the reformation or the renaissance or the renewal that is happening in our own time. It's been going on for quite a long time now, 10 or 15 years, but it's really distinctive. The interest in spirituality, prayer, psychology, the inner life, all of that is, is really um, is a tremendous renaissance. And now we're about 20 years into it. And I think the uh, interest and the importance, and what I want to highlight tonight, is the same thing was happening in the late 15th century and 16th century in Spain, but of course throughout Europe. So there's lots of similarities between that time, 500 years ago, and our time. So I'm going to be weaving and trying to intersperse the relevance of the mystical teachings and contemplative teachings from the Spanish mystics of that time. And, of course, Thomas Merton prophesied this, that the contemplative life was going to become more and more important and he regarded the most urgent task was this renewal of our lives and you're probably aware towards the end of his life he had a conversation with the Tibetan Lama who had faced the decision of whether to leave Tibet or not to save his life and the Lama came to Thomas Merton and Merton said from now on brother everyone stands on their own feet he went on to say, you can't rely on structures. The time for relying on structures has disappeared. They are good and they should help us and we should do the best we can with them. But they may be taken away. And if everything's taken away, what do we do next? So, and that was 50 years ago, so the church structures, the institutional structures, a lot of the old structures in society are, are genuinely changing. And a lot of people uh, feel the anxieties and the worries and the impact of that on their lives, psychologically, economically, and the like. So the uh, call is this renewal of our lives this seeking, this ongoing conversion oneself. And it's very interesting that the great teachers, that's, that's my phrase, like Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bourgeau, who are the real pioneers of, and Lawrence Freeman and John Mayne, 
they've been speaking about this uh, emergence of the contemplative mind or this unitive mind, which really makes a lot of sense to me and connects to the importance and the increasing interest in the Christian mystical tradition or contemplative tradition and the rise in the interest in meditation, this extraordinary flourishing organisation of meditation that's here in prayer, in what happens in the inner life, the nature of our soul and the like. So this movement of the inner life towards, towards union, this changing of our psychology, this changing of our mind, which is what prayer and meditation and mindfulness and all of this work is moving towards changing our mind to open to the capacity to see differently, to see the world differently, see the world from a unitive place, from a deeply connected place, from a place of love, from a place of relationship and connectedness, all of these themes are walking around what we, we would understand today as the contemplative mind. And that's very difficult for many, many people because we're used to being self-sufficient and achieving and having our own agenda, but something's really changing to move to a different model a different symbol and a different experience. And so this renewal of meditation, prayer, mindfulness, is about this change in our mind, this change in our consciousness. So the old symbol could be understood as a Cartesian wheel, that they were all, we're all separate parts, independent parts, operating in this system or... Um, uh, relating in that way. But this new symbol from a contemplative or unitive mind would look something like a luminous web or a mandala. So something flowing from the centre, some energy or light or union or something that deeply connects everybody. Every person, every soul, every fibre of our being connected in this radiation of light or luminosity or love or this mandala of relationship. So this movement of the, into the contemplative mind is very much not the either or but the both and. So in the contemplative mind or unitive mind, we can hold the opposites. This paradox, moving to paradoxical um, understanding, being really comfortable with differences and diversities. And that's, I think, what we're all being called to move to a new mind. So there's that, that unitive mind living or participating from a, a symbolic understanding of a luminous web is very uh, is what we're being called into. And that's part of this great renaissance and renewal that is happening. Teresa of Avila says, uh, and the mystical tradition will say, this is the place of our soul. So it's this deep place in our centre which, of course, that's what meditation and prayer is all moving towards. And tonight I'm not going to be focusing so much on Teresa, but she has an extraordinary uh, description in her interior castle about this place of our soul. And she talks about our soul is where there's a fountainhead which shines like the sun from the centre of our soul, which never loses its radiance. So something begins to flow from our centre. She calls it a fountainhead, which shines. There's a radiation from our centre, which doesn't lose its radiance. 
she also talks about the soul as a diamond. So this is the search of the immortal diamond of our true self in Christ, or our diamond body. And of course she uses the famous um, symbols of the castle, the interior castle, with many rooms and many mansions. So there are lots of symbols that are describing what can't be described in words. So walking around these great symbols of the soul, and that's the journey in prayer and meditation and reflection um, towards that center. So I'm sure if we were to speak with each other, we would we would all we could speak about when we're in deep meditation and deep prayer or deep silence, what happens? You know, what's the taste of that? Well, I'll give some um, traditional characteristic um, taste of that. We feel very alive. There's a there's a tremendous life or um, aliveness in that centre. There can be a sense of freedom, freedom from anxieties, cares, worries. Like Teresa's symbol of the diamond, there can be a transparency. We're not really worried about anything anymore. There's something really transparent. Remember this shining light in the centre. There's, there's something that can shine from that place. There can be an extraordinary sense of well-being. We feel happy, the world is good. There's a tremendous sense of well-being. The Spanish mystics spoke about this gustos, this taste of God. It, there's a taste of goodness, it tastes good. So this sense of delight and joy which flows from the centre, from meditation and prayer. And the capacity to give and receive love more and more, and the capacity to give and receive more and more. So there's this flowing, this movement. We're not so caught up with ourselves, but this joy, love, that comes from God, that comes from Christ, is flowing within the fountainhead, in the centre of our soul. So, I'm going to be speaking about um, one particular great Spanish mystic this evening. But there were many, many Spanish mystics. There were actually 22 of the known writings that we have. And Alison Piers, 50 years ago, the great scholar of the Spanish mystics, had two volumes of the studies of the Spanish mystics. So this is the first one that has the famous Spanish mystics of Ignatius, Luis de Granada, the man that I'm going to introduce you tonight, Francisco de Asuna, and of course the great Carmelites, Teresa and John of the Cross, another great Spanish mystic, Luis de Leon, who was professor at Salamanca and who edited uh, Teresa's works after she died. These are all, the, the rest of them are completely unknown. That's why I've taken an opportunity tonight to say their names and introduce you. There's a whole school of Spanish mystics, of, um, of a, a mystical school. Juan de las um, Angeles. That's just the first volume. There's a second volume of 13 other Spanish mystics. Most of the West has, hasn't heard of them. I'll just say their names. Garcia de Cisneros, Bernardino de Larido, St. Thomas of Valneva. Peter of Alcantara is very important. That was Teresa of Alvila's guide. And Peter of Alcantara, when we've taken groups to Spain, Peter Tal and I have taken many pilgrimages to Spain, we go up to Peter of Alcantara's Franciscan Hermitage in Magredos, which is his sanctuary. And Peter of Alcantara actually appeared to St. Teresa after he died in his glorified body, helping her with the reform. So that's all written down in Teresa's 
biography. So he's a very important Spanish mystic. Another one, Juan de Avila, Jerónimo Gracián, Alonso de Orisco, Diego de Estela, and quite a few others. So really, the point of uh, showing that is that there were a whole school of Spanish mystics, and they're the ones that wrote a lot. There must have been many, many hundreds more who weren't writers, who didn't feel that they could uh, put it down on paper. So, what I'm flagging up is looking at the movements of reform and renewal that were happening in that time, as we're going through a similar renewal in our own time. What I'm going to be speaking about tonight primarily is this great book. Um, no one's heard of it. This was the book, Third Spiritual Alphabet, by a man called Francisco de Osuna, that Teresa was given when she was a young woman by her uncle. Teresa had this in her mid-twenties when she was going through great difficulties, sort of a kind of well, breakdown, but we're all, diff we're all having difficulties in our 20s. And her uncle gave her this book, and she writes in her autobiography, this book was her guide and master for 20 years to the prayer of union. There's very little in the English language. Um, Richard Raw mentioned has a few lines in one book. So a colleague and I, a team of us, got the hint a couple of years ago and started studying the text and looking at it. And it is one of the great mystical texts of the 16th century, but very hidden. A bit like the picture of him on the front. No one knows, he's one of the great hidden Spanish mystics. So just a little bit of background, the emergence of the Spanish school. There was a great movement and interest in interior prayer, from the late 15th century, from the 1480s, particularly amongst the Franciscans. So the Franciscan houses throughout, throughout particular areas of Spain were starting to be called into deeper prayer. And what they called it was a prayer of recollection, recogimento. So that was the term that they used. And so the first occurrence of the Prayer of Recollection is in 1500 in a text by Cisneros. So really, don't be, don't be put off by the word. It's really a movement, like in our day, of deeper prayer and meditation and the inner life. <laughs> this great renewal in Spain had certain char characteristics in common. There was a universal call to Christian perfection, a validation of external works and ceremonies, the increasing importance of interiority, the relation between the active and the contemplative life with the importance of the contemplative life, the importance of the gustos and consolations, this tasting, this delight, was very important in the mystical theology of the time. So what this renewal and what this text focuses on, and remember, Teresa has this for 20 years, so she seeks, she's steeped in the recollection, the prayer of recollection, all of the renewal that Francisco Osuna is summarising in this text. So this renewal movement emphasises the knowing in the heart, the importance of unknowing in the ordinary mind, and also uh, the experience of embodying that heart knowing. So the body is very important. So this prayer of recollection is a way of effective contemplation centred on love without thinking of anything. So we, we would understand that as contemplative prayer, as contemplation. 
This was the major text of the recollection movement or this call to deeper prayer. And it was thousands of people had this text, enjoyed great popularity. Why he's so interesting, uh, particularly to me, but I guess, is because he's so psychological. What he's doing is putting, up, putting down the movements in the soul towards union. This recollection, what is happening within us when this increasing centering within is happening. And I'll, I'll unpack that a lot um, as, I, as I'm speaking. What he also does is give an incredibly wide range of really helpful symbols and images from ordinary life. And we can now see that Teresa took quite a lot. I mean, the interior castles in this text. So a lot of the ones that she um, uses, she's seen how useful it is for all these common symbols and images to be used, which of course is deeply psychological. So Asuna was born in 1492 in a town called Asuna. He was uh, a Franciscan and lived a communal life in a traditionally Franciscan way. He was a prolific writer. He actually wrote six of these. So this is just one. So this is, this is the most well-known one, is the third. And he was provincial of the Franciscans. So he was, um, but you only get little bits of that in the introduction to his life. So he's a very hidden Spanish mystic. What Asuna emphasises is the recollection, this prayer, is not only a gift received, but something we participate in others. And I'll be expanding on that as well. So he's talking about uh, prayer creating community, prayer being as the centre of community, and prayer actually being the basis of community. So very much the connection between the inner and outer is not separate in the way he's understanding. When we read the third spiritual alphabet, this text, we're really aligning ourselves with the mystical tradition. And this text in Asuna is credited with transmitting the mystical tradition from the earlier centuries, from the Victorines, from Gingersol into Spain, and, and the carrier of the contemplative tradition. So he, we encounter the word heart regularly, and he talks about the heart being the source of life, and that joining up where all of reality is recollected in God. So he's talking about recollection in an interior way, an interiorly descriptive way of what is happening in prayer and meditation. He talks about seeing reality with the eye of the heart, this heart knowing, this spiritual knowing, and this movement of recollecting all the separate parts of us into a oneness. I think we would understand it today as all our separate bits of us, all the fragmented bits, all the unconscious parts, all the parts of us that we don't know, which is a lot, in the path of prayer and meditation, there's this gathering up of all of our unconscious and our conscious. So we're walking around everything that we um, is disconnected in ourselves. So that's the way that he's um, using it as a sort of spiritual psychology of prayer. And he uses many tremendous symbols and images. What I'm going to go through now is very briefly go through some of the core themes of the treatises in the text. He flags up the importance of mystical theology. So very much it's in the uh, time when uh, speculative theology was um, very strong. 
So he talks about this division between mystical theology and speculative theology. And he talks about mystical theology, which is the basis, theological basis for prayer and contemplation and movement to union as hidden. We don't really understand, it's hidden. And he says that mystical theology pertains to the will, which is, which is enamored with the highest good. And this is the theology of God's just lovers. He says no one can teach this theology. I do not presume to teach it in the alphabet, nor can any mortal do so, for Christ reserves to himself the ministry of secretly teaching the hearts where this theology lies hidden like a divine science. So this theme of hiddenness, being taught directly in the heart, is very important. And there are other terms for mystical theology or the mystical tradition. It's called the path of wisdom. So it's the wisdom schooling, the wisdom path. And use a very interesting phrase which goes with the gustos and the taste of goodness, the taste of meditation, delectable knowing. So we can taste it, it tastes good. I can see people's faces, they kind of light up. There's something, you, you know the taste when you're touching something or something's touching us. It's called the art of love. Only through love is it realised. Also, it's known as the path of union, unity of consciousness, the contemplative mind. He says, the person who attains to God in this prayer is made one spirit with him by an interchange of wills, whereby he wants only what God wants, and God remains with man's will, and together they are like one in everything. So that's a symbol of union like Teresa talks about, this union of the God and the soul. It's clear that this is a continuation of um, the mystical tradition in the secret hiding places of the heart. So the first treatise, he gets right into talking about or doing a commentary on our existential condition which is that we're separate from God, we're fragmented, we're completely distracted, we're all over the place. If there's no practice of prayer, meditation, no interior life. And he has this extraordinary <coughs> helpful pithy saying. So the beginning of every treatise, there are 22 in this volume, he gives a wise saying like a lecto divina and when we do workshops and retreats we we use these in a lecto divina way <laughs> so maybe when i speak it maybe have a sense of it and he's he's wanting to use it as a in a lecto divina wisdom saying like the beatitudes like an extension of the beatitudes may the person and the spirit always walk Together, may the person and the spirit always walk together. What he's wanting to focus on right at the beginning is this possibility of this harmony between all the parts of ourselves. This walking together, this, possi this possibility that all the parts of ourselves are walking together. Body, mind, soul, spirit, feelings, all of the parts of us are walking together in harmony. And he's addressing how divided we are, modern language, conscious and unconscious. You know, this is this movement of recollection, this movement that all the parts of us begin to link up, all the dots are joined, there's this movement of reconciliation within ourselves. 
So he has a wonderful discourse on the possibility of harmony within ourselves, and he does include the body. The body is absolutely insane. This is embodied knowing. It's not disembodied. We actually come into our body more. So our body, our mind, our soul and the spirit are all walking, going in the same direction. He talks about a harmonising of the powers of our mind. And he's also showing us the impact of our thinking that can be out of step with the other parts of ourselves. <coughs> so usually, um, if there's not a practice of prayer meditation, our, our inner life's like this. It's all uh, uh, conflict and difficulties. They're all going in different directions. And the recollection is they're all starting to move together to the same place, which is in the interior of our soul. He's flagging up the lack of harmony, what the effect is, and that unless we're able to move to this inner place where there is harmony, it's more difficult to receive the grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in this unitive place within. He talks about the harmony of emotional energies, and this is very modern. A lot of our spiritual direction or counselling is trying to bring a harmony between all the parts of ourselves that aren't getting on or don't relate, actually getting them to relate and actually connect and work as a one. He talks about harmony in the conscience and the harmonising the powers of the body and the mind in prayer. May the person and the spirit always walk together. Really profound wisdom <coughs> saying. I'm going to move on to um, the mystical theology was in Treatise 6. He has an extraordinary <coughs> chapter in, in helping us to recognise ten movements of recollection in the soul. And these movements uh, are, are really helpful because they help us uh, observe and notice the changes that are happening within us in deeper prayer, in this movement towards union in the centre of our soul. So this recollection is joining, reconciling, gathering and collecting up all those separate parts of ourselves into a unity. What he says in the recollection, it gathers together those who practice it. It gathers community because there's, a, there's a, an, an, an intention of oneness. There's an intention to want to gather, to want to gather together and recollect. So recollection creates community. In this recollection, there's a drawing in of our awareness from the exterior to the interior, to this movement away from distractions. This might seem obvious, obviously, to all of us where meditation is really important. But he's talking about what happens in that movement in the soul. When we bring our awareness to the interior, our concerns and anxieties naturally fall away. So when we bring our attention to the interior, we let go of concerns. He also talks about this reconciliation between body and mind, sensuality and reason. So what he's flagging up is all the parts of us that are at war and in conflict gradually dissipates as, as all the parts of us get to connect with each other more and more. The fourth movement in the soul is this inclining towards solitude, this inclining and desire to be more silent and solitude. And that's a natural progression of the life of meditation and prayer of finding the sustenance, this fountainhead, in silence and solitude. 
He also says the recollection quietens and calms us down. So all the agitation, we become quieter, calmer. So he even flags up our instincts, whether they be aggression or uh, power of sexuality or the instincts that might be working against us are recollected up within the meditation and prayer within us, this harnessing of our instincts. And very importantly, he talks about the possibility of emptying, this kenosis. So being emptied of our worries, our concerns, everything that's in our mind, the distraction, it's gradually being emptied out for the goodness or the virtues or the Holy Spirit to flow in in the emptiness. And that's a very big theme that he speaks about, emptying the heart in order to be filled with wisdom and virtue. He also says the eighth movement is that there's a realisation and fulfilling of our true spiritual identity. We would understand that, our true spiritual identity in Christ, in love, the diamond self, the soul. So we're moving, we would understand it, now moving from what uh, is our conditioned self, it's not necessarily false, but it's our conditioned self, to something more true and whole within. So you talk about this movement to our diamond self. He talks about the transformation of the powers of our soul. And John of the Cross picks up on this very strongly in the spiritual canticle. So this is a bit uh, talking about the faculties of our soul, our will, our intellect and our memory. So the transformation of our faculties in prayer and meditation into joy and delight and love. And then he keeps on walking around. The last movement of recollection is moving towards this dynamic centre of union in the heart, which unites God with the soul and the soul with God. So again, this possibility of our fragmentation or all the separate parts moving together into <coughs> the oneness. Moving on, the second treatise, this is one of my favourite actually, he talks about the importance of gratitude, radical gratitude, as an essential element in healing of our soul. I haven't seen this written in such a clear, explicit way in any other treatise. And he, the wise pithy saying is, let all your works abound in fervent thanks. Let all your works abound in fervent thanks. And he talks about this process of gratitude he talks about the effects of gratitude. He talks about different levels of gratitude, ordinary gratitude and infused gratitude. But this is one of my favourite um, sections of this treatise in his use of ordinary symbols to try and get his um, mystical theology across. He says... In this case, God is like the sea when it feels the rivers flowing back and judges that their waters are not lost to the great sea and of divine abundance. If we return to God in thanks, the waters of gratitude will not cease flowing in us, but will be like the rivers described in scripture. All rivers merge with the sea so once more they can flow. All rivers merge with the sea, so once more they can flow. 
Do you want the water of grace that God has granted never to dry up? Then return it in gratitude and God, not needing it for himself, will restore it to you multiplied and blessed. And seeing his gift is alive in you, he will be gladdened and you will soar grandly like the living waters coursing back to their primal source. So the quote that he has in there is from the wisdom tradition, Ecclesiastes, so he's actually absolutely steeped in Proverbs, Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes. So he's very much talking about the importance of gratitude. We go to the next treatise. Very interesting. So the theme here is finding our spiritual identity in silence and surrender. So the wise saying in this treatise, how the soul is to be with God, blind, deaf, dumb, and always meek. How the soul is to be with God, blind, deaf, dumb, and always meek. Bit different. What's he talking about here? Why has he written it so early in this text? He's talking about in silent prayer the not seeing with our physical eyes, the not hearing with our physical ears, the not speaking. So he's talking about what happens in silent prayer this change in our spiritual perception. John of the Cross speaks about, in prayer and in our deeper Christian journey, God is transferring his goods within us from sense to spirit, from our physical senses to spirit. There's the creation of new organs of perception, new interior organs of spiritual perception. The smelling of the Holy Spirit. It's not a physical, it's a, it's a smelling of the gifts of the Spirit. Seeing not with the physical eyes, but the spiritual eyes. And hearing the voice of the Spirit, not, it's not by the physical senses, it's by these new spiritual organs. So what he's talking about is voluntarily becoming blind, deaf, and dumb in silent prayer. So a certain inner blindfoldness happens, plugging up the ears or stopping our speech. So this movement into deeper silent prayer is the move from reliance on our physical senses of organs and perception to the inner life, to the soul, to the subtle interior organs that can hear and listen to the movement of the Holy Spirit. It's a, uh, he talks about becoming deaf to guard the heart. So that's being deaf to the thoughts, the worries, the concerns, not disturbing the peace within, because it can get very disturbed by all the movements that are not of deeper prayer and silence and peace. This can be a protective turning of our deaf ear to the push and pull of our emotions and our charged thoughts. It's a wonderful saying, how the soul is to be with God, blind, deaf and dumb and always meek. So this is the waiting in silence with our spiritual perception and closing the gates of our senses. What he's talking about is the willingness for us to be blind, deaf and dumb is his language for surrender, for our surrendering in silence 
that we don't really understand what's happening. We can't really make choices like we did or like we normally do in everyday life and that our memory is changing. Our memory is being transformed into the memory of celestial things. It's all about silence and surrender. Uh, charging ahead, I can only spend a few minutes on, it, on each one. This is the next one, Treatise 4, is an extraordinarily important treatise. He's talking about safeguarding the heart. The maxim, the wise saying is, safeguard the heart, empty your heart and pour out all created things. How do we protect the silence, the growing seed of the heart, the centre within? Well, he gives quite a lot of spiritual direction and advice. And it's very interesting in Treatise 4, he's got the castle symbol. So Teresa would have read it, and she uses that as her major symbol for the soul. So he's talking about safeguarding our heart in order to protect and safely contain the growing emptiness, the growing letting go and surrender within. And he has a very interesting symbolic description. He says there are various gates to the heart. The first gate is the gate of our mind. And he has a whole treatise, which I won't be having time to look at, maybe in the questions I could amplify. How do we close the gate of our mind, all of our thinking, our thoughts, particularly our destructive thoughts. I would regard some of what Asuna's writing is as a text on Christian mindfulness because he's really dealing, he really understands our mind 500 years ago, but it's still as modern as ever. And the problems in meditation and prayer when our mind is too active the whole area of destructive thinking, I would, I would say it's um, contemplative CBT, really, in terms of how do we close the gate of our mind so it doesn't intrude and get in too deeply into the centre of our soul. So it's the first gate is the gate of our mind. There's a second gate. There's three gates he talks about. The second gate is the gate of our will or our intention or our passions. And the third gate is our memory. So again, it's the same structure of the soul of the intellect, the will, and the memory. And if you read John of the Cross or you're interested in John, he's got the same schema of the interior life. So the mind the will and the memory. And he says, in meditation and prayer, the gates are, there's a movement to be closed. And he says, in the first gate, which is the gate of the mind, deceit is protected against by thoughtful reason. In the second gate, which is our will and intention, Fear is protected against by the fire of divine love burning within. And the third gate, memory and desire, hunger is protected against by the appetite and desire for celestial things. So what he's talking about is each of those gates of the faculties of our soul, there's a transformation. A transformation from... Um, not being a really aware of how our mind works, to thoughtful reason. And partly he's saying that's why it's important of mystic, why the importance of mystical theology is that we can, we can reflect and understand what is happening in the soul. And that's what these great Spanish mystics have all this literature to help us. The second gate is our fears, our anxieties. They're very instinctive. Our, um, 
willingness or, or lack of willingness. And he says, in this second gate, the fire of divine love is burning and it will help this movement into deeper prayer and meditation. The third gate of the memory, this appetite, desire for celestial things, is what is being more and more remembered and is this movement into deeper prayer. I'm not going to have time because I see there's five more minutes, but I've actually done a glass icon of this fourth mansion with all the symbols that he has in it. So in the icon, there are three gates of the heart. It's out straight from the text. So in the fourth um, treatise, he says, we call the heart a paradise. Because wherever God is and takes his delight, remember this tasty knowledge of God, there is paradise. And it is described as earthly because it is located in the earth of the body. It is located in the earth of the... There is no separation between body, mind and soul. He says there's a fountain which can flow in the centre... Grace is like a fountain watering the paradise of the heart. Teresa picks up that idea of this fountainhead, this paradise. He says there are three kinds of trees in this earthly paradise, which signify the trees of virtue. This is the part that I like. He says there are three cherubim, or angels. This is symbolic that guard the gates to the heart. The cherubim in the company of angels, and they've got a sword which is on fire that helps this discernment, this discrimination, which, um, which belongs in the centre of the soul and which doesn't. So uh, Teresa picks up the same. She doesn't, have, she doesn't talk about the gates of the heart, but she talks about this interior castle's movement into the centre, and I've tried to display some of those themes in the glass icon. I'm aware of the time. I've been speaking for 55 minutes. I think it's time for a break. And we'll I'm going, the way I thought best is the second half, we'll have questions and discussion and much more interaction. This is more time of sharing or questions or what's arisen or um, if I can try and relate my understanding of either John of the Cross or Teresa or um, Francisco de Asuna. I think a lot of people are quite familiar with Teresa nowadays. Um, so, Liz. interesting to get your take on it from the point of view of you being a Jungian psychotherapist. Yes. Because I just can't help thinking that yes. for you it just must all come together. <laughs> but you haven't really verbalised that and I, I, I'm not quite interested. I haven't verbalised it tonight but in all my talks and um, writing over the last 15 years and certainly the first edition there was a lot of Jungian psychology in that. Um, certainly on the earlier mansions and expansion, the symbols, the purpose of symbols. I wrote a paper, Symbols of Transformation, Christian Spirituality, and took Teresa's symbols of water, butterfly, um, castle, diamond, and what it means psychologically. Um, because it, it really is... Uh, Jung's psychology, they're symbols of the self, symbols of the soul, symbols of the centre. So they point to something that's, that's invisible from a three-dimensional or four-dimensional capacity. So it's Jung's understanding of the symbolic function. Yes. And is there a dark side in this? I mean, is there Adults. a dark side? Well, because there is. And the fire. Well, there is. <laughs> It's just that in my own psychotherapy, which was very Jungian, mm -hmm. um, was 
it, there was a great exploration of my own dark side. Yes. So yes. how does that how is that reflected in what the mystics achieve? How do they integrate that? Or, or don't they? Or don't they? they do. I'm yeah. sorry I didn't do the Teresa talk tonight. But she refers to the lizards and the snakes, which is our shadow, and she puts that in the first mansion early on. So as soon as we turn towards our unconscious in the early stage of it, so this is beginning stages, as soon as we turn inwards, da da, lizards, snakes, all of what we don't know about ourselves, both benign and malignant. So, you know, the whole spectrum really comes up to consciousness. So that's the beginning. So she puts the lizards and snakes in the first mansion. So it's very interesting because Teresa has been immersed in Asuna for 20 years. So she makes a lot of assumptions um, and shortens the first three mansions because it's the recollection. And then, the, then her interior castle is focusing on the prayer of illumination and the prayer of union. So she assumes that all of that is a constant process within the understanding of the mystical tradition that there are three ways. Beginning in meditation and prayer is awakening, purgation, purification. So it's the purification of all our rubbish, all the stuff we're not aware of, our unconscious, and that can take most of our lives. And then there can be some opening or cleansing or this movement of um, towards this recollection. What do we really desire? What's our one desire, as Ignatian would call? What do we really, do we really desire God? So this purification of the desires, so all the desires that aren't of God, change and are um, brought into this recollection, and that the shadow is part of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can talk a little bit about the Dark Knight, but the Dark Knight is different to this. John of the Cross's Dark Knight is speaking about, I could, could be, I've got my notes to give a little talk about it. The dark night is when we are um, called into really profound unknowing. Really profound, <coughs> real loss. We really do not know what is going on in prayer. And there are three classic signs in the dark night. We can't pray in the way that we've always prayed. We can't use our discursive mind because the mind's not working in the same way. This is move to contemplation, to silence. And as, as I said, John says, God is transferring his goods from sense to spirit. So it's dark night of our senses. We can't will the way we did. We can't remember the way because it's all plunged into this unknowing, this darkness. And Teresa actually still puts the dark night in the beginning stages of prayer because it's within the purgation, purification and awakening. But it's really the teaching of John that's so helpful there are lots of fantastic books, all the Carmelite books. The Impact of God is a classic. It's helped so many people and, and a lot of the other, other ones really. Well, Kim's book, which is more Dancing with Your Shadow. But, but again, it's all moving around the same area of, of dwelling in unknowing and darkness. I come to this through um, psychology as well. Yes. Um, I'm Freudian. Yes. In fact, and I've worked, I've, I've worked with very disturbed children, so I'm actually a Klein Yes. And all the symbols that Klein uses about the good and the bad breast yes. and splitting and projective identification is all really 
an attempt by Klein to explain much of the same sort of thing. What happens in, in the interior life of the infant? Yes. And the and then the as the infant grows, there's a, an, an attempt to combine everything together in a wholeness and a peaceful well, never well, not with the children I would work with, but eventually a peacefulness, hopefully, and a reconciliation of all the good and bad bits. Yeah. And I think that's really quite profound, really. It is. Um, and Melanie Klein's book on envy and gratitude is, yes. is yeah, one exactly. of the best books ever. And her notion of gratitude, that if you can get beyond the destructive stage of the envy, yes. yeah. and yeah. focus on the gratitude of, yeah. and but the wonderful thing about Melanie Klein is that it's the darkness that you, you mentioned that made me think of it. Is that there is always that it's always there. Mm -hmm. You may be able to be reconciled. You may be able to bring things together. There's always that dark bit. That that it, there may be gratitude, but there's always still the envy buried somewhere. Ah, oh, but maybe that can change. Well, it doesn't always mm. stay. And I think this is very... I think in, in sort of therapeutic work with the children, though, yes. unless, yes, unless yes. I came to really appreciate the yes. dark side of the kids, Yes, yes. there was no hope ever of yes. bringing them into light. Yes, exactly. This is the cusp, which is fascinating, which is the kind of um, where all the energy is in our time between psychology and theology. I mean, that's what's really engaging us. So what is psychological and what is theological? I think the interesting thing about these texts is that it's got a lot of psychology, but it's also got a theological basis. So it's not just psychology. It's within a larger framework. It's within a religious framework a bigger visionary framework, if you want to call it like, these are my words. Um, but certainly in my early days, uh, when I was steeped in, you know, kind of Freud and, and Jung, um, there was a great change in my life where I required a mystical theolo theology perspective to link up my experience, what was happening in silence, beyond my mind, prayer, um, and all sorts of others in this kind of, in a type of recollection to, to connect them up in a whole that worked inside. And I think that's, that's the cusp between the psychology and theology. And why I made that comment is that I work with, I've worked with adults for 20 years and I, I really have seen profound transformations and changes from really disturbed places. Um, towards some sort of center. I mean, I'm kind of summarizing it. And I think that's the real movement today. So what's happening in the heart? So again, what Asun is talking about, which is what the author, this movement of the mind into the heart. So again, these great themes between of psychology and theology, which, which the Spanish mystics have at their center. Thank you for that. Um, I, correct me, but I, I always understood from the shadow work of Jung that actually there's an awful lot of good in the shadow that hasn't actually been brought out as well. 95% of the shadow is pure gold. Exactly. Yes. And it is absolutely pure gold. And that's what Teresa talks about. Mm. The lizards and snakes are essential. They're our human nature and they turn into gold. Mm. Yeah. It's the prima materia. If you don't have lots of it, you've got lots of prima materia that turns into pure gold. So that's the purpose of you know, deep suffering, deep conflict. It can turn into shining gold. And again, look at the lives of these people. Look, I'm not gonna go through Teresa's life, but um, she was very troubled. Her grandfather was a converso, was marched through the streets of Toledo by the Inquisition. I mean, that was the times of Spain. She was um, threatened with the Inquisition. They would have taken her to the stake if she'd lived much longer. John of the Cross was completely persecuted by his order. These, pe these are the people's lives. And most of us carry tremendous suffering. 
because it's, it's connected with this longing for God that they kind of go together. So it's absolutely 95, 99% gold. I guess one more with the, sorry, um, with the, you, it's a danger of compartmentalizing everything. It is. And yes. being a very sort of almost scientific in a way, because that's awfully nice and easy. It's very easy. And it's very secure. Yeah. But surely, um, I didn't know it was a danger of over, over analysis actually in it this. Is. Yeah. I mean, here we are in muddle whether it's 95% or whether it's 55%. Yeah. But here we are. Yes. So, exactly. all little people. But <laughs> well, what I was thinking when this gentleman was talking is that, you know, we have lots of different personalities and different psychologies appeal to different personalities. If you're very high in thinking um, or very high in intuition or very high in feeling or sensation, you'll be attracted to different psychology. And that will change often from decade to decade in someone's life. But I would say from a theological perspective and from an Asuna perspective, there's this movement of recollecting all the parts within it. And we've got to be <coughs> involved in different <coughs> introvert and extroverted activities for this wholeness to happen. We talk about second half of life, movement from introversion to extroversion. And I think for, for older people, you can see this, what's called golden thread through one's life. If we're over-intellectual, you need to go and volunteer in a children's home or go to Africa, something that's opposite of that, because that's the shadow. And that's where the gold is, in often the opposite. That's where the life is. Go to where there's life. And life will be in the opposites. That's traditional Jung. You know, compensation, go to where the life is. The head's a function. You know, there's lots of different parts of us. So you're absolutely right. We've got to live this life where there's this gold thread to the center. Thank you for that. I think the two most important words we mentioned was love and surrender. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. Love. Surrender. Love and surrender. Love. Don't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two we all. most important spiritual words, perhaps. Yes, we all experience it differently. We all have different um, relationship between the active and the contemplative life, the Mary and the Martha. <coughs> and we'll be moving in different times of our life towards the active or the contemplative life. More Mary, if we're too Martha, um, uh, we get stressed and anxious, we've got to become more like Mary. But yeah, if you've got the great themes, the theological and psychological foundation, the healthy theological and psychological foundations for that, which I believe Asuna and the Spanish mystics are. Uh, talking about and, and lived really. So, oh, sorry, one more thing. Was it something specifically Spanish that it leads into, into Spanish, Spanish mysticism? Just mm -hmm. as you could say there was a lot of Englishness in Rome and Hilton. Yes, that's very interesting. Maybe a Spaniard needs to. I think there's a particular focus on affect. Uh, it came out of the uh, culture of the three faiths in Spain in 1492. The Jews uh, and the Muslims were expelled from Spain, so you had the Christian monarchs. And so uh, there was such great turmoil and revolution and renaissance in Spain. And that gives great rise to interest in contemplation and mysticism, you know, finding a centre from all this ferment. So I think the historical, the cultural um, uh, features, the tradition that mysticism was very strong in Spain. For example, the great Jewish mystical text, the Zohar, was written in Avila in the 12th century. So there were great centres of Jewish mysticism through Spain, 
Toledo was known as the Second Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, there was a great revival of Jewish mysticism. And the Sufi centers through southern Spain were very strong. Ibn Gabira was the great Jewish mystic, but you had the, the great Sufis. So I think all of this uh, movement gave rise to the, these schools that appeared. I hope I'm answering your question, but it's kind of very, why, why Spain at that time? There was a school of translators in the 13th century in Toledo, and all the great books from the Arab world that were written in Arabic were all translated in Toledo. So that had been the center of um, culture, really, in Europe in the 13th century. Yes, that's right, Maimonides in Cordoba. Yeah, very important. So when you kind of tap into all this, Spain was like the second holy land. It was understood as, a, as another holy land. I love talking about it. Come to Spain, two years' time. The Carmelites are going to... I spoke to Eugene McCaffrey last night. He phoned me from the Carmelite Centre in Dublin. He says, will you be part of our pilgrimage to Spain in 2015, which is the 500th anniversary of the birth of Teresa in 1515? So it'll be busy there. Yes. And following on from that, could you tell us a little bit more about the different writers um, that you mentioned in those two volumes? I mean, were they all religious, and um, was their work available just within their communities, or was it available because it's still very early days in terms of printing and distribution of? reading matter and people couldn't read and did, were their works known at the time or were they discovered you know in, in our time could you just tell us a bit more about that please i don't know very much i'm just working on asuna <laughs> and that's as i said there's nothing in the english language on on asuna um so i think i'm going to plow through um, some of the others, but I only know some of the others because they're all in uh, Teresa's autobiography and we've been to those places and then you say, well, this person must have known this person, this must have you know, been connected to this person. Um, so I don't know much more my specialties, um, the three of them really, but it, I think that's why I wanted to bring it and open that up tonight and look more at... Um, but Peter's book, The Return to the Mystical, ha yeah, has this summary, <coughs> which is what I spoke about earlier, of this commonality of this movement. Because he, he did his doctorate on Teresa and Wittgenstein, and he spoke on the importance of Asuna in his book. So this summary of um, why it was such a major movement of renewal. I can't say very much more because I don't know you. Yes. It's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, my question is, um, these were full-time religious. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> and yeah. so they lived in an atmosphere which would help them enter Completely. into this kind of, um, you know, world. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm curious about uh, the lay people of the time exactly. where they kind of as well imbued by that kind of mystic kind of yearning or desire. It speaks to me today. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, that I'm, I don't live in that exactly. atmosphere of, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. How can I live this kind of mystic life yes. in, in my own world kind of stuff? I mean, I've got my own answers yeah. for it, yeah. but uh, these were full time. Exactly. Um, they gave their life for it. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe it can be full time for us in now, living in in England, in London. And I think that's the fountainhead which can flow from within. You're spending time in prayer. I spend an hour every morning in silent prayer. I can say something really flows for the rest of the day. And I think if there's this calling to solitude and silence and this real tasting of what flows from that, there will be this calling and drawing within if there's enough yearning and enough desire for it. But yes, there were the pros and cons of being full-time religious, but there were a lot of lay people 
in the, they weren't necessarily priests or monks or nuns, just ordinary people in around the Franciscan houses. But maybe the, um, the, the early years was the reform of the Franciscans. But the yearning is there. We have to live in this culture and this century, but it is possible. That's why I was thinking this garden of the heart is so important. Exactly. The gates to the heart. How do we close them? How do we keep that precious fountainhead from being um, swamped? How do we keep that paradise in the heart safe and protected and empty for God's um, grace? You know, uh, spiritual community, the meditation groups are absolutely vital to each other spiritual companions. And make it more often, make it every day. And I think as the priorities change, if that longing gets stronger and stronger, our life will change and that will be the centre wherever we are, where, whatever century we live in. How does grace initiate that? <coughs> Sorry? How much is grace initiating that? It seems even at the level yeah. of contemplation, yeah, yeah. we can't at some level without grace. We don't do it all yeah, on yeah, our own. Yeah, yeah. So, because um, yeah, meditation yeah. seems incredibly countercultural, that's why it's so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet, is it? It's not entirely in our hands whether people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, or potentially can listen to that in their minds. Yeah, yeah. When you were going through the trees, it is very much a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a two-way thing. Isn't Completely. It? Soul responding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is the bridal mystical tradition. So the soul is the bride and the beloved. So there's always that dynamic movement of love. But there's another great um, saying that grace builds on nature. So a lot of this is becoming healthy in our nature. The harmony being able to say, safeguard the emptiness within, safeguard the silence. And then grace is more likely to flow in because it's not so damaged, it's not so obstructed. There's an understanding in the heart of what's happening. And that's why Asuna's very helpful because he's talking about the, the 10 movements of recollection. The purpose of that is to relax the mind. Ah, that's the movement of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. So you can relax and say, oh, you can, you can recognize and identify it. And that will begin to become more conscious, that movement of recollection. And then grace will flow in because it's like, it's like the light of the sun. The light will just pour in because it's ready for that. And that's the shadow work, it's the dark night of this emptying of ourselves and why it's so critical, this purification. And the purification intensifies because our inner life needs to be open to the one love, the one desire from all the thousands of desires. And it will just flow in naturally. Yes, I think Thomas Merton always is very he often say you don't know the consequences of your meditation. <gasps> yes. That's quite powerful. <gasps> yes, absolutely. And I think because <laughs> I know I'm kind of um, uh, repeating it a little bit, um, because the mystical theology works. If you've got a practice that's deepening, um, this purification will happen of its own accord almost, with lots of help. And then the waters of grace will flood in. And that's why helping to understand the taste of God, I mean, I help quite a lot of people when the mystical life is intensifying, just to help relax and understand that's how the Holy Spirit works from being um, quite um, versed in the text, really, to follow what the spiritual direction of the Spanish mystics. Because that's what the interior castle is. It's a spiritual direction manual of prayer. That's why she wrote it. So when that's happening, <coughs> just go to the great 
masters, which are these three extraordinary people. Well, the cusp between recollection and quiet is less and less efforts. It's very clear. You can't do anything. And that's the dark night. That's the third mansion, is no efforts. That's what's purified. You can't do anymore. And that's very difficult for most people. You're kind of pulled into darkness. There's nothing. You can't do anything. Our efforts have finished. So it's pure surrender and pure grace after that, in the dark, unknowing. No doing. Okay, I'm reminded of the last meeting here, which was the cloud of unknown. Yes. And uh, he spoke about the dark longing of love. Absolutely. It uh, has to pierce that. Yeah. Um, I think you were here. Yeah. Yes. It's exactly and, the same. Uh, uh, that's been a tremendous image for me yeah, um, yeah. since I've heard the talk yeah, that it's yeah. this dark uh, this dart sorry not dark, dart of, yeah. of love yeah, yeah. which is yeah, the yeah. only thing that will penetrate exactly, Teresa has the same image in her own life called it the transverberation of the heart so this arrow of love pierces her heart it actually happened um, and that was part of the great, the second conversion um, of her life. And someone came up to me mentioning about going to the Incarnation in Avila, which was the monastery, where, the convent where she was for 20 years before um, she started the reform. And in the Incarnation, um, if they allow you into an inner chamber, um, it's where Teresa experienced the transverberation in one of the cells. And you can visit that kind of chapel, a really sacred chapel. And on the floor, it's written in Spanish, apparently when they were building the chapel and the workers were there, they didn't believe any of that this had happened. And apparently something happened. She either spoke to them or said, um, this really happened, some, some, something happened, and so it's on the floor that the builders and the workers actually had a conversion in their life by working at this. It's a very powerful chapel where she experienced the transverberation. So it's very real, I think, this, this dart of light, of love, um, or illumination in the dark unknowing. And John of the Cross says it's the movement from sunset to midnight to sunrise. Well, it's first in John of the Cross. <laughs> so it's the sunrise. That's why I did this um, glass icon of the sun rising. So the sun, we would understand it as the divine son of Christ, begins to rise in the heart which is his light, appears in the heart. It appears in the intellect, this light, which is understood as the light of Christ. So if there are no more questions, uh, is there another question? If not, Let's just thank Julian for a lovely evening. <laughs>